you know, kind of hopping in, you know, uh, it's it's really quite an honor and a pleasure to kind of be a, able to kind of communicate with uh, engineering leads like yourselves to kind of talk about, you know, certain cultures, certain patterns, you know, certain things that worked, you know, for me in the past as an engineering lead and, you know, kind of uh, our ability to kind of, you know, evolve, you know, the engineering environment and engineering teams and, and bring a little bit more uh, uh, energy and passion into what we do. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Hassan Habib. I am a senior engineering lead in the Mixed Reality HoloLens uh, organization. Uh, I just started uh, in this organization just uh, about five or six months ago, but I've been at Microsoft for five years. And uh, overall in the tech industry, I've been you know doing this for 22 years. Uh, one of the uh, things that really intrigued me the most about, you know, the tech industry is uh, is that it's like, it's like Satya says, it doesn't respect tradition. It really, you know, it doesn't matter whether you've been in the industry for 100 years or two years, you know, you can come up with an idea and flip the table upside down, just change everything. And that's what makes it very, very interesting. You know, uh, it, all it takes is just someone sitting with a keyboard and a, 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 a an internet connection in a garage and they could build the next app or the next website that can change everything for every one forever right and that's a great thing right but when it comes to um, building enterprise systems you know things need to be a little bit more systematic and more organized so you can get the best value out of the the, the work that you're doing uh, as an engineering lead myself you know usually my my main focus here is uh, the people right you know they call us people managers for a reason but you know, even when I was like just an engineering lead, someone who doesn't really have any management powers, you know, I always thought to myself, if the engineers are happy, you know, then whatever outcome you're expecting is going to come as a side effect, right? So if you are making the engineers happy, you're investing in their happiness, their evolution, you're making sure that they're comfortable, that they're paid well, that they're compensated the way they, they should be, and that they they're, uh, they're, there's a clear strategy and a clean clear plan for them to kind of, you know, evolve and grow and and, and continue to, to, to kind of learn and take something home with them and actually use it at home from work. You know, the more and more you invest into these aspects uh, of an engineering team, the more likely you are to kind of find yourself uh, working in an environment that is just vibrant. You know, the engineers are super excited about what they're doing. You know, they're super invested into the mission and the vision. They feel like they are taking part into building something bigger than them and bigger than you and bigger than everybody else. They're building something great that they can go and talk to other people about and share their experiences. So, um, I brought with me here today just to kind of keep me honest and you know if I go a little bit you know uh, off rails or claim that you know something is true uh, you know kind of he keeps me honest is Andrew Andrew McClelland Andrew is my uh, one of the folks that are working with me on the uh, outer space team our team is called the outer space apes and uh, you know there, there's something funny about the name but uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this uh, Andrew do you want to kind of introduce yourself you know to everyone and tell them a little bit about yourself sure yeah no as, as Hassan said um, hi my name's Andrew McClelland I work for work on Hassan's team in mixed reality um, I've been at Microsoft for just over three years now um, and on the mixed reality team since the start of this calendar year so going on nine ten months um, and yeah fortunate uh, enough I think to um, work under Hassan and and kind of learn learn kind of his his experiences in, in Microsoft and elsewhere um, and see how we can implement it um, within our team. Uh, I, it's been very different for me. Um, you know, it's it's different experience, and I've uh, I really quite enjoy it and kind of follow the same uh, development architecture patterns um, in my own kind of personal projects outside of Microsoft. Um, but speaking for myself, I quite enjoy it. Um, I think the rest of the team quite enjoys it, um, and it kind of creates a exciting kind of collaborative environment um, developing, particularly now that we're remote. Um, you know, the whole pair pro pair programming, which we'll get into. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit about me. Thanks, Andrew. So, so he mentioned something about collaboration, right? You know, somehow, you know, 
I, I couldn't figure out yet why, but food always tastes better when you're eating it with someone else. Whatever you're doing, when you're doing it in a group of people, whether you're trying to solve a problem or playing a video game or, you know, just simply going out for a walk, somehow time just goes by when you're doing it with other people, right? So I started to realize that there's some power in this. There's a magic, you know, into doing things together with people. And some yonks ago, some people kind of came up with an idea called pair programming which is allowing two engineers to work on the same deliverable and the same task at the same time, right? From a business perspective, if you go to, you know, business folks and tell them, hey guys, you know, you know, we're going to have two people working on the same deliverable at the same time. The first thing that comes to their mind is like, that sounds like a waste of time. Why would anyone do that? But if you actually look at the process itself, it has proven and i've been doing this for years and years now you know uh, undoubtedly and statistically proven that when two people are working on a task the task gets done faster the, the task has a very high quality because you're not kind of uh, uh, kind of fading away you know just sitting alone isolated in in a room somewhere working remotely and you have this big task that you need to work on sometimes we feel this little heavy weight right something on our chest like oh i need to get up and do this thing but if someone is sitting there in a pairing session a meeting that's set up for two three hours and they're waiting for you and you know that they're going to sit there and go through this problem with you and work through this problem with you somehow this weight gets lifted off even in trouble like when you find out that you're in trouble for whatever reason and you find out that you're not the only one and other people are also in the same trouble it makes you feel a little bit less it'd be like oh so it's not just me i'm not the only one in trouble there's a lot of people in trouble great you know so it's just kind of a weird uh, social aspect of ourselves that kind of uh, uh, drives you know this energy drives our ability to kind of deliver uh, things and go through things we are very social beings whether we're extroverted or introverted we're very social beings and we're working with other people and communicating with our people and trying to deliver software with other people somehow it gets you know uh, more uh, uh, value and you get more uh, kind of impact out of it when i joined andrew's team i basically you know, started looking around and seeing what is the opportunity that we can have, what projects they're working on, what are the capabilities that we can kind of need to implement. And I started saying, hey, guys, let's let's kind of pair together, right? Let's write software together, right? So the first question that came to mind is that, how do we do that? You know, how do you pair? You'll see a lot of people have all different kinds of, school of schools of thought when it comes to implementing pair programming. Some people say, oh, there's a driver and there is an observer. So someone just sits there all day just observing the other person kind of writing the code and just giving them comments. I worked with this model for a while at John Deere back in 2015. And that model was a little bit boring, right? It's less interactive. It's a less engaging because the other person also wants to write code sometimes, right? And then I took this model a little bit and I started experimenting with it against, you know, other, you know, folks that kind of do the same thing. And I came up with this idea that, you know, kind of changed how pair programming can work forever. Uh, I call it pure pair. Pure pair is basically the idea that one person will be writing a failing test and then the other person will be responsible for making that test pass. And then that second person will write a failing test and then they give it back to me to make it pass. Right. Right now, I want to show you a demonstration of how that works. But before that, I want to stop and take a 10 second breather and see if anyone has has any questions. All right. OK, so let's do this. I'm going to. I'm going to share my screen here real quick just to show people kind of what we have. It's a very simple uh, uh, system that Andrew put together just to kind of demonstrate how we pair program. And what the system is, is just simply a student function. This is a simple service and this service has a bunch of dependencies, right? And what I want to do here is that I want to go and say, I want to be able to receive a student uh, uh, request or a student model or input, and I want to persist this in the database, right? Obviously, you know, sometimes you'll see people going and saying, oh, that's easy. I know the answer. Let me just go like this and do this and do this and insert and done, right? That's 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 the story, right? No, that's, that's not how, you know, we kind of decided to move forward with this. We decided to do uh, TDD with pair programming, pure pair, which basically means that I would need to go into 
a test file like this and go write an actual test. I'm going to write a test here real quick just to show you guys um, how this works. I'm going to go and say should add student async like this. And then I'm going to go like this and say, OK, here is my given when then. And then I'm going to go here and say, OK, I need a student. So here's a student like this. Here's a random student. Created a random student and then I want an input student. I intentionally try to kind of um, uh, create multiple variables with the same uh, uh, value, right? To kind of honor the naming convention in here. So you'll see all of these variables, they have the exact same value, right? The only difference is that wherever I'm going to be using them, it's going to be very, very relevant you know, to the place where I'm going to be using them. So in here, if I'm setting a mock for a dependency, for instance, I'm going to go here and say storage broker setup, and then I'm going to go here and say, here's my broker. When I call this broker with an input student, go ahead and return asynchronously an inserted student like this. So basically, I'm, I'm trying to uh, have the variable fit the context of the place that I'm using. And then I'm going to go here and say, here is my actual student like this. And then I expect that when I call the service to add a student with an input student, that my actual student should be equivalent to, right, to my expected student like this. There we go. Expected student, right? So this is done. Now I want to go and verify that my mock has actually been called only one time. So I'm going up in here and saying broker dot insert student in sync. Here's my input student and make sure that this guy has been called only one time, just like that. And then the last thing here is that I want to make sure that my dependencies have not been called outside. Like if you have insert and update student and all that kind of stuff, we want to make sure that these dependencies have not been called outside of this context. So I'm just going to go and say verify no other calls for any of my dependencies. So nobody can sneak in, you know, any uh, uh, any calls or any details for uh, any of these dependencies. Now I'm just going to run my test. So this is my part. I am pairing with Andrew right now. And I'm basically doing my part. I'm telling him, here's my failing test. Here's my expectation. Please go ahead and make that test kind of pass. So as soon as I write this failing test, watch how we're going to leverage the commit history in our code to kind of keep track of how the code has come to be. So it's keeping track of the, it's like a timeline of how your feature was implemented. So now I have a failing test because it's basically saying not implemented exception. So this is a good failure. There's a bad failure and a good failure. I'm going to go and take that test name and put like a thin arrow like this and I'll say fail. And I'll show you later how that looks like in in the commit history. Just like that, I gave Andrew a failing test. Now Andrew is going to take my screen. This is literally how we pair remotely, right? Uh, we're working, we're on a team uh, call and we have the session and we're pairing with each other. Now Andrew is taking my screen and he's going to go pull latest and he's gonna make that test pass. Check it out. Yeah. So I so pulling down the latest. I'm just gonna make sure that when I pull it down, that as Hassan pointed out, we've got a failing test, and mm -hmm. it's failing for the right reasons. And so I go in here. I know he's asking me to call that service, and I can say, "Oh wait, this dot storage broker insert student," and that's what he's asking for. I confirm that my test now works because now I'm calling the function that he asked and we can see it's all green. So he put in a thin arrow dot fail for this test and I'm going to say, hey, I made it pass. And that's pushed up. And so we've got a commit history of him giving me a failing test and then I return a passing test. And so it's now my turn to give him a failing test. Um, I'll pause. We'll, we'll do one more test on showing how we do exceptions, but I'll pause for any any questions. Um, before we get there. Oh, we lost Andrew. So he's letting me answer the questions. <laughs> Any questions from anyone? I think he's having a connection issue. Anything at all? So Hassan, um, I, I just not specifically about the uh, the code, uh, but the, uh, the the practice. Uh, this looks uh, exactly like the pair program pro, uh, pair programming uh, uh -huh. that was around back in two thousand 
2007, 2008-ish. Uh -huh. um, and, I, and, and I was uh, part of this kind of practice. Uh -huh. And just the challenge that we had in pair programming was uh -huh. uh, the level of uh, um, uh, the developers should uh -huh. be kind of aligned and uh -huh. understand the uh, technical skills required uh -huh. to deliver uh, um, uh, and to implement a given uh, problem. Uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. a given solution a, a given solution so uh -huh. wouldn't that create this kind of uh, uh issue now because i believe it was not uh, uh it, it didn't go well during that time because like different different uh developers are at different levels at, in in a given uh, team so you have uh -huh. a team with a mix of uh, developers so uh -huh. this was a challenge that we had uh-huh yeah absolutely so so that's the thing you know one of the biggest you know uh, advantages of pair programming is that it levels up the play field like it kind of goes and says if you have a principal software engineer with 20 years of experience and you have a junior engineer on the team and they're not at the same level when they pair up together they balance each other right this is how you ensure that you don't have on your team uh, uh, an imbalance of power. So you're basically going and saying, hey, principal engineer, in order for you to succeed, you have to lift up the junior engineer with you and get the feature delivered. Okay, so it automatically kind of hands itself over to the idea of you have to be, while you're pairing with people, if you're at a senior or a principal level or higher, you have to find a way to communicate that information and walk the junior engineers through step by step until they kind of get solid into a point where they can actually write you know tests and they write systems you know i'll kind of let andrew here talk a little bit about his experience like andrew has been you know in the tech industry for about five years he's been at microsoft for almost a year now or, or three years three years now and uh, andrew andrew how was it like when we started pairing with each other at the beginning how was it go ahead yeah, I guess, I mean, at the beginning, as I kind of said at the very start, it was quite different. Like, I'm, I wasn't used to the pair programming. I wasn't, we did some test-driven development in previous teams, but it wasn't really to any um, particular extent. Um, and I'll say, first and foremost is, especially with the team kind of being remote, some in office, some remote, um, you feel, uh, you get the energy of working with someone in kind of a collaborative environment that's not just set up as like a meeting to talk about business, but you're when you're pairing over two to three hours, um, you're getting, you're kind of like sharing some energy. You're talking about work. You're talking about water cooler, you know, water coolers talk on the side um, and you're getting your work done. And then as Hassan pointed out, you know, if I'm, if I'm a junior engineer and I'm working with a senior or a principal engineer um, as they're developing, I can, they're, they're uh, vocally thinking out their thought process and their design process. So instead of me just seeing a PR that comes from them and I say, Hey, like I assume they've done it right. Cause they're a principal engineer but I don't really understand the logic behind it. Um, I'm there while they're trying to figure out the design, while they're trying to implement it. And so I get stepped through that, that process um, just by being on a parent programming meeting. And then they say, okay, hey, it's your turn. And then I try to implement that process or um, follow that same design. So I, I think it's been a great way for me to learn. Um, and I think for the rest of the, the team to learn as well. Um, and then it's also got that kind of that social, you still keep up energy within the team, even while we're working, uh, you know, hybrid. Yeah, there's there's a very important aspect, like to, to Andrew's point, like you could make as many tech leveling sessions as you want. Right. You could go and say, oh, let's bring up all the engineers. And, you know, I have all these years of experience. So let me just give them an hour or two hour session where I tell them about all that kind of stuff. All of this is great, but. There is nothing that's more impactful, you know, into the growth and the evolution of engineers more than pair programming, especially when you're pairing with someone. There are these little little things that happen during a pairing session that you just can't put a name on it. The little shortcut that they learn about, the little Visual Studio trick that you can do, you feel like the team is slowly but surely is starting to share the same experiences, but also at the same time, you, didn't, you don't end up with uh, uh, saviors on the team. This is a big problem that you see in a lot of organizations. You see the folks that I call SAMs. SAMs is like a savior architecture model, like an organization architecture, where there is one person that's a subject matter expert 
he's the only one that worked on that component and nobody else knows anything about it. And then Mr. Sam goes on vacation or leaves the company and now everyone else in disarray. Have any of you ever seen that situation before? I know I have. <laughs> so, so when this happens, how do you kind of combat that pair programming? If Sam is pairing with John and John is pairing with Jane and Joe and all of these and Janet, you know, you'll end up with a team that can comfortably go on vacation without having to worry that the work will not continue. It creates also a nice environment of trust between people. You can, of course, go ahead and buy pizzas and ping pong tables all day long, but nothing is going to lift up a spirit of a team than having them kind of intertwining their fate together and their deliverable is never going to happen unless they actually lift up someone else with them and bring it over. I don't know. This is a very long answer, Danko. What do you, what do you think? Yeah, I, th I think just I, I agree. Um, one thing that needs to be created um, uh, in the in that particular environment is uh, setting a proper expectation uh, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. like especially just um, junior developers get uh, pressured uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to work along with like senior or principal uh, de developers, um, uh, and then just uh, assume you get a that little intimidated. Yeah, yeah, assume yeah. that they are expected to be as um, uh, you know as productive and just as uh, fast as the more experienced uh, developer. So just any other thing is um, at the beginning, the productivity is not going to be as fast as yep. Uh, yep. the single um, uh, senior uh, uh, developer because because like just the senior mm -hmm. developer not only uh, shows the way but also uh, not only implements the the uh, the solution but also just you know enables uh, the others to be at the same pace uh, in thinking and implementing. But the That's value right. that I see uh, is. As you just, if somebody's uh, on your shoulder to watch what you're mm -hmm. doing, you basically properly think uh, yeah. and then uh, ensure that you you are not just uh, giving some garbage or out of standard implementation yeah. from security perspective, from code quality perspective. Yeah. Those things um, uh, would get a very good uh, 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 attention by both people and just uh, instead of spending uh, a long hours of code review yeah. right there you have been reviewing your code uh, yeah. with two yeah. people one suggesting uh, the the solution the other implementing and just uh, changing the, the 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 chair so that yeah. that expectation has to be set you have to properly set expectations saying that you know just it might take this long yeah. Uh, yeah. or some some time until we all get to uh, the same level or yeah. in a closer uh, 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 level of understanding of the pro the business problem, the technology, uh, and so that we can uh, be productive in the process. Absolutely, and and you know, there's nothing that speaks louder than numbers, right? Uh, you know, of course, there's uh, you know, I'm going to show you here a nice diagram of how my team, you know, kind of took on. Uh, a, a, a solving and delivering software. This is a simple system that basically keeps track of our contributions and all that. And you can see the difference between the first month versus the next month. Of course, this is hackathon week and people going on vacations and stuff like that. But you can see the difference here. It's almost double the capacity and capability. You give you give a, a, you know a junior engineers you know the tooling and the dedicated attention you know, to delivering systems and you kind of standardize these systems. Like it has to be standardized. Like you can't go and say, oh, pair with me on this mysterious thing that we're going to work on together, right? And then every time you come there, you will be faced with something that's completely out of rhythm and out of, you know, you have to standardize. You have to go and say, here is a predictable, deliverable components that you can focus on, right? So, you know, we're going to be working on this and we're going to be driving this. Just like how me and Andrew, you know, uh, uh, are doing this right now. Uh, of course, I agree with you. There's a little bit delay and that's the kind of long-term investment that you do. First month, a little bit slower. I didn't, to be honest with you, like first month, I said to myself, even if we don't deliver anything at all, but the team is becoming more kind of familiarized with pair programming and knowing how to kind of build systems and understand the standard, it's still worth it because the next month that team is just going to skyrocket and go up to the moon, you know, and now everyone is kind of uh, 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 on the same page. Like it's a team culture, right? You're building this culture with this team. You're trying to build it this way. Go ahead, Abhishek, you have a question. 
Yeah, it's kind of a side question, maybe. So, does the complexity of the task, right, or or the timelines mm -hmm. uh, play any role? How effective the peer programming would be, uh, or is just uh, agnostic to that? That's a great question. So now, as an engineering lead, you have to account for that, right? You have to go and say, okay, if I have a complex problem, can I break it down into simpler? deliverables that can actually uh, uh, kind of display progress. It can show progress. You can show that you're still working on the problem. It's a big problem. It's a complex problem. But at the same time, we're making progress. You have at some point in time make the trade off between lifting off another engineer on the team so they come on the same page and deliver the feature with you or just go and do it by yourself. They always say this is as cliche as it sounds, but I believe in it all wholeheartedly. They say alone, we can go fast together. We can go further, right? Alone, you can do it alone. Like a your principal engineer, you're going to pick up the system and build it in a day. But where's the fun in that, right? If you do it by yourself tomorrow, they're going to come back to you again and tell you, you have to do it again and again and again. And now, you know, Hassan is not going to be able to go to Hawaii because Hassan is the only one that knows how to do that system, right? It becomes a problem. Right. So complexity of the system, it depends on your timeline and how much you can negotiate. There are situations where you have to go and say, OK, this really has to go out in at the end of the month. Right. You can at this point in time, you can start going and saying, OK, can you do this part with me? You know, while this other part I can pair with a little bit more senior engineer to kind of push it a little bit further. This is, these are the trade-offs that you kind of have to make. But I always kind of lean more towards you know, bring someone in with you, let them see the heat with you, and let them push harder with you. So at the end, they can also celebrate with you. Go ahead, Ron. Thank I'm sorry, you. Michelle, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I think a, a lot of what we do today, uh, especially in our space where we deal largely with data and pipelines, uh, in a lot of ways, they're, they're pushing to like sort of abstract the coding away from us in some mm -hmm. regards. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, in your experience, do you find that this pairing uh, of engineers also works in scenarios where it's not explicitly coding and instead doing some sort of abstraction of that, maybe building a pipeline or something of that nature? So so for building pipelines and stuff like that, we even codified that. You know, maybe Andrew can show us a little bit how we build our pipeline. Did, Andrew, do you want to show the people? So here's the thing. Even if you're building a pipeline, right, even if you're building a simple action that's going to happen, it needs to be codified. Right. And if it needs to be codified, that means that two people can sit down and do it together. This way you're making sure that they share the experiences and that one of them can, you know, go focus on something else where someone else is still a subject matter expert. This is, by the way, we're building our stuff in the open source space. So this is our actual day-to-day uh, -day work. And if you look at the script generations, we basically went and said, we need our pipelines also to be written in C-sharp. So this is how we literally build our uh, build uh, release, uh, testing, uh, all the little things that you can think of, it's all pure C-sharp. It goes and generates all the details that we need, pulls in the secrets, and basically builds a pipeline for us so we can be go build our systems and deploy them. Is this, Ron, is this the pipelines that you're thinking of, or is there a different kind of pipelines? I know you're thinking maybe pipeline, data pipelines? No, I mean, yeah, I understand. And of course, in a perfect world, we always want to put everything in code and, you know, I advocate for that. But sometimes, you know, we have legacy solutions where we don't we don't always have time to to do it from scratch and do it the right way. Mm -hmm. And there's a change that maybe isn't directly coded, although mm -hmm. maybe should be. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'm curious if the pairing of engineers, if you're seeing any improvement in engagement, if these things still translate to where coding isn't always exactly what we Canon. Even if you're clicking buttons around, like let's just say you're clicking buttons, you're not really, you're not really writing any code, you're not really doing anything, you're just clicking buttons. Having someone else with you to be a helper to unblock certain things or do certain things, the idea here of an engineering lead is to be able to paralyze and divide and conquer. Right, that you're not always going to have this linear task where you have to do A, B, C, D, A, F in, until you get the, all the pieces done. You can do A and B at the same time, right? So this is where you go and say, okay, let me do A, you do B, let's keep going on this. The fact that someone else is sitting with you on the call, right here, right now, dedicating time, not an act of charity. So you're not going around begging people for a couple of minutes to help you out. You know, but rather this is a dedicated time in their day where they have to sit down with you and actually deliver these systems with you is very important, whether it's coded or not.
Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm, I'm happy to hear it, it translates in your experience. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would even add on to that. I think one of the best beneficial kind of areas where we do our kind of paired programming without the programming is a lot of um, anything to do with bugs. So if we get bugs come in and we're looking at, you know, we're looking at App Insights, we're trying to look at different logs, there's, you know, no coding, nothing being done. You're not kind of stuck and, you know, banging your head against the wall saying, I don't know how to fix this. And then, you know, I don't want to reach out to someone because they're busy, but you have this dedicated kind of time where you've got people with different experiences, different um, kind of specialties. And they're like, hey, go check out the, these logs and maybe think of this because I've done this before. Um, I think that's another great application of kind of the paired working session that's not programming specific. Well, one of the biggest things that I've seen kind of, nothing prevents an engineer from learning except for two things, shyness and fear and arrogance, right? An engineer that's a little bit higher in their level would be like, I'm not going to ask this guy, you know, I know everything, right? Or an engineer that says, oh, imposter syndrome, if I ask them, they're going to think I'm not, I'm incompetent. But if the time is dedicated from day one, that these two people have to sit down together and solve this problem together. Now you don't have this problem, right? Either whether you're shy or not, now you're going to have to work with me, right? It also it also hands itself out to the um, kind of nice kind of subtle feature where the team actually gets to know each other. Like like forget about the task, forget about the the task in hand. While you're working on something, inevitably someone is going to go and say so andrew you're from canada huh? how's it going up there right and they'll be like so where are you from you know and oh you like uh, spicy food i like spicy food too to see things are starting to evolve you know while people are communicating uh, i always say that pair programming is a social activity you're actually going out there to sit down with someone and get a problem done right back a long time ago maybe early 1990s or something like that you know you know a programmer was being portrayed as someone who was sitting in a basement you know with a lot of boxes of pizza and just sitting there hacking around and doing this 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 age this era is over you know this is a new era where actually we're taking you know the era of github a github when it first advertised itself advertised itself as a social network for software engineers right that's that's the very beginning when it first started and it worked you know people are starting to talk to each other share experiences and get the best out there any other questions? No, I don't have any question, but I have a comment. Go ahead. Um, um, I find your you know, description very, uh, you know, uh, especially relevant because when I think about reflecting on what we're doing, um, we're we're I feel like m at least my team we're doing something similar. We call it a working session. And every day we have the working session and it's, you know, spoke of people, two or three people together, ex um, exchange ideas, comparing notes, even doing the PR, right? And mm -hmm. you say, hey, asking questions and uh, can we do this better? Can we do that way? And I think coming back to what Andrew just mentioned, when you have a bug or live side or whatever, you have multiple people. Actually, you look at this log, you look, there's multiple inter intermediate points. Each mm -hmm. person look at a different one and then collectively. Um, uh, comparing notes and, and see where we are. And we're doing a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what happened is, you know, from what you described, it, it's 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 a it's a great thing to make that, to be formalized that, you mm -hmm. know, working session is something we just uh, created organically because um, in the past we, we, you know, when we release or something, we want to make sure we have someone watch over the shoulder to actually mm -hmm. um, uh, to, to, to be extra safe, but having that you know, formalized codify as a culture, as a practice to say this is a peer programming, doesn't matter if it's a coding or designing or just a soliciting information or exchange notes, they're all actually really, really good for um, the whole team to, to improve their collective understanding and to actually um, helping each other to learn. So this is Absolutely. great. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, what I usually tell people is that it doesn't matter whether we're writing code or making cookies. Let's do it together and see what comes out from the other side, you know, and usually uh, just the fact that you're here's the thing. OK, everything aside, listen, we spend the best, you know, eight, nine, ten hours of our day, you know, doing this work. Right. And if we can't extract out of it more value. You know, if we can't engineer the engineering process in a way that can we can extract more than just delivering tasks and and getting paid, you know, then why not? Why shouldn't why should we optimize this process? 
I feel like I've had people in the past reach out to me say, Hassan, I stopped going to my therapy sessions because of these pair programming sessions. I feel like this, you know, social aspects that I'm trying to fulfill within myself is already there. You know, I feel a lot happier, less stressed, less depressed. I feel like someone else is carrying the weight for with me. This is different. This is a different world that I'm working with. Something I really highly recommend uh, for people to take a look at. Any other questions? Okay, Andrew, you're going to have to write a failing test now. <laughs> Let's go back to this one. <laughs> yeah, Teams was not liking, uh, liking me sharing. It hung up on you. It's just <laughs> it's like, you don't need to write code. Please, please, brother, do control and roll, you know, the wheel just to, to kind of zoom in a little bit. I'm, I'm getting a little older. I can't see code anymore. Yeah, thank you so much. Sitting close to the screen. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so before uh, I was kicked out of the Teams call, um <laughs> if everyone remembers i so i made this uh the failing test that hassan gave me i made a pass and made a commit and so now i'm going to give him a failing test and so what this failing test is going to be um is so if everyone remembers is that you know simple call to insert a student into a database and we're just we just want to validate that this student object is not null and so we're going to do some validation on it um and so what we're going to do is we're going to set up ooh, let's import that um, we're going to set up a null student object. And then we're going to set up a null student exception object, new null student exception that we've already set up. And then we wrap this in a what we call a validation. <laughs> Did it kick him out again? <laughs> Teams is doing all kinds of fun stuff with Andrew today. <laughs> all right, you know, I, you know, I'll wait for him to come back. But I, you know, what I really wanted to kind of help, kind of help people see out as an outcome of this, um, uh, of this session, is I can now just so you guys look at this. You know, I can now navigate at any point in time to any. And I know you can't see my screen yet. I'm just kind of trying to find uh, the. Uh, all right. Did you get did you get kicked out again? <laughs> you probably want to uh, team just killed me. Do you, you want to step out of uh, R zero or something? R zero. Yeah, we're going to get out of ring zero. OK, you're going to have to restart, though. <laughs> I will be back again. Sorry Sounds good. That. Yeah, no worries. So so while people are while you're doing this, I'm just going to show people real quick. So check it out. So um, let's just look at any feature in here. So if I look at, you know, mixed reality core, and I'm looking at some of the um, uh, closed, you know, pull requests in here. Let's pick up this foundation service, for instance. If you look at this, I know for a fact this is just a random one that I'm just picking up. If you look at this, look at the commit history in here. The commit history is telling me the story. Someone made a fail, they merged with master, someone made it a pass, and then someone made a fail again, pass, fail, pass, fail, pass, fail, pass, fail, pass. See the history here, see the switch between the pairs is telling you the story. The culture of the team is resembled through code. Go ahead, Ron, you have a question, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna ask, um, you know, I, I noticed you guys are not using the live share feature built into Visual Studio, and I yes. was assuming it's for this reason to make the Git history more prescriptive. Is yes, that, that right? exactly, that's exactly what, you know, I wanted to use it, but it doesn't give me this kind of ability. Also, one more thing, it's, you know, when you're relying on a network back and forth, now it depends on the person that you're working with, how much kind of latency they're dealing with. But when you're switching back and forth like that, they're working locally on their machine, and when they're ready, they come back to you. If you use a code share or live share, now the host has to always be available. Sometimes we do something called offline pair. What is this offline pair? We have to, one of us does have to sit through a meeting, right? And you know, you're just listening in, in the meeting, but you can still push failing test and getting back passing test and exchanging messages between each other, right? Sometimes this happens when you're pressed against a crazy deadline and you want to kind of get things going. But otherwise, yeah, maintaining the history here is really important. Making sure people that get recognition for the effort and work that they did, you know, based on their uh, contributions to any feature is also extremely, extremely important, right? So that's that's one aspect of this. If you go back to 
uh, the repository that Andrew and I were just uh, working on. This is the demo uh, demo repository. Uh, I think it was sample. Sample. Yeah. Okay. Sample, yeah. Oh, you're here. Uh, you're here, but you're here. Okay, so sample app, there it is. Okay, so look at this. This is what Andrew and I were just doing. If you look at the commit history here, you'll notice the history tells you exactly what happened, right? Someone established the infrastructure. They made a quick fix. I wrote a failing test. And you actually go and see that this is truly, through the commit history, you can truly see that this was test-driven because there is no uh, code that was written here that touched the business logic. This is truly just the test. And if you look at the implementation, this is truly just the implementation, just enough to make that test pass. So this is another uh, uh, example of showing people, no, this code actually was test driven based on hi history and commit history and all that, all that kind of stuff. And then at the end of the day, you get to the point where you go and say, I'm looking at this commit history. Like for the longest of time, I've seen software engineers kind of squash that. They squash the commits and they say there is whip, work in progress, and then there's delivered. And the history of what happened between this and that is gone, right? So now if I want to learn how this code came to be, I don't have that history anymore because I don't know how this feature was written. What kind of thought process people went through? We made the commit history of any repository, a story that you can read and see how a feature has been implemented, which makes people really, really happy. I don't know, Andrew, are you happy? Is the team happy? I don't know. I think they're happy, <laughs> you know? Anyway, um, uh, we, ha we have about, you know, 10 minutes, you know, I'll have Andrew kind of write the test. And if any of you have a, have a question, please feel free to jump in. We're just, you know, th there's, there's a little thing at the very end of this uh, meeting that I want to share with you, but uh, let's just see what Andrew is doing here. Go ahead. Let's hope, right, he's, well, let's hope he stays on. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully teams doesn't blow up now that I've clicked the share button. Um, Good. Okay. So we've got the, we've got the null exception and we wrap it in a validation exception um, just so that we can localize and say, Hey, what type of exception is this? Um, so now we're going to set up the actual uh, call. So we're going to say add student task, and this is going to be a call to the student service at student, and this is going to be the null student. So here we're passing in that intentionally null student. So you, so you are testing that if a student is passed in and it's null, it throws an exception. It says this student is null. Is that what you're doing here? Okay. That's, that's exactly it. And so okay. now we're going to actually say, hey, when we call this, um, this function, uh, in this test, let's assert that a uh, exception was thrown. Can can you tell he works on the lab, the automation lab so much? He wrote he wrote oh, actual boy. lab validation. <laughs> that's that's right. a, See, that's I'll I'll tell you at the end why is this so fun. But let's just keep going. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Let's see, student validation exception, and then we're just going to say throw that when the add student task is called. So now we've got it set up. So when this uh, function is called with a null student, we want a null exception to be thrown. So now we're going to say is the actual the actual uh, exception should let's import fluent assertions should be equivalent to the expected. And let me drop that down. And then we're going to say, hey, uh, now that we've caught this exception, we want to verify that the logger was called uh, and that the correct logging function was called. So we say blo uh, broker log error, and we want to make sure it use mock is exception as the expected. And so we want to make sure that the actual logged error that our logger is spitting out is the actual exception error. Um, that we're throwing. And then we want to make sure that that's only called once. And then similar um, to what Hassan did before um, is that the storage broker, since we caught, uh, since we don't want to insert a null um, student, we just say that the broker dot insert student, um, and this can be, we don't really care what the input yeah. uh, is. We say that this was never called uh because uh, an, an exception a null exception was thrown before we ever called the broker so the broker never it's called and then we do a simple so that's times never right 
Yeah, on line 41. Never. Yep. And then we do logging. And that's never. So basically what we've done here is we've set up uh, an exception that we expect to be thrown when a null object is passed in. We ensure that the test throws it. Then we want to make sure that the COD exception is the same as the expected. Make sure we've logged it correctly and make sure any other broker call that was not expected to be called is not called. Um, and so I'm going to run this. And I should get an, a fail that says, hey, we ex expected this type of student validation exception, but nothing was thrown. So now pressure's on Hassan to throw me that <laughs> exception. And similar to before, I'm running that uh, unit test uh, with a skinny arrow fail and push that up for Hassan to pull down and make pass. Okay, there we go. We made there it we through. Go. Perfect. Now I'm going to take it from Andrew. See how we're kind of ping pong style. You know, he, you know, I give him a serve, you know, I, I serve him a failing test. He serves me back a failing test. So I'm not just going to get latest, you know, like this. And let's just see how this works out. Let's do this. I'm going to run all the tests. Usually it's a good habit to kind of run all the tests, you know, just to see whether uh, the most recent implementation uh, has broken anything uh, even with projects if your project is written this way it doesn't matter you can go up to, I've went up to 4,000 tests and it would take literally about 30 seconds to execute um, so if the tests are written this way now I can just go and say okay he's expecting me to throw an all exception I can probably do that I can just go up in here and say hey I need to um, uh, validate so let me return this and then I'm going to go and say validate validate student then i'm going to pass in the student in here and i'm going to create a partial class with this partial class is going to give me the ability to kind of go and say you know let me put all my validation in a little part of the service so this is validations in here so this validation piece in here will basically go and say here is my private static void validate student here's my student student in here and I'm going to go and say if student is null throw null new null student exception null student exception just like that okay control k e control k k d kind of cleans up things a little bit okay so this is a validation piece but Andrew is expecting a that it gets wrapped up in a categorical kind of uh, situation so I'm going to go and pick this up again and paste it in here and I'm going to do another partial class to just take care of the exceptions. So one class will take care of validation. We think about object programming as an object. That's a 3D object that has different aspects. So I'm going to go here in the exceptions area and I'm going to do this. I'm going to go and say private delegate value task student returning student function. This is something that we call exception noise cancellation. I'm going to show you guys in a second what this means. Uh, 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 try catch like this, returning student function. Here's my returning student function. And there's, here's my try catch. And I'm going to go here and say return, await, returning, await, come on, returning student function. And then I want this null student exception in here and then i'm going to go and say throw create and log create and log validation exception create and log validation exception with this null student exception in here like this and now let's create this function for us here it is and i want to throw a student validation exception with any exception that can can get passed in here And now I'm going to go like this and do that. So here is var student validation exception equal new student validation exception with this exception as inner exception. And then I'm going to log it. This dot logging broker dot log error. And this is my student validation exception. Probably need to make this exception type. So make this guy happy. And then I'm going to return this student validation. So, so we wrap the exception. Now, now watch this. This try catch in here is basically abstracting away exception handling. So I can now go and do this little trick in here. I can go like this 
and say try catch and then whatever exceptions are hiding behind that can be handled in this special partial class so i can keep the engineer focus on the business logic code right uh, now if i go and kind of write kind of run this this test in here there we go and that's a pass right so basically now i am whatever andrew is served up to me now i can go and say oh i i kind of got it figured out now i can pass this over here and then it goes on and on it becomes my turn to write a failing test andrew makes it pass on and on and on like if you go and look at the um the sample app commit history now you can see the entire story of me and andrew kind of see i wrote a failing test he makes it pass he writes a failing test i make it pass so one two one two one two is like that if you noticed during the session by the way his his little uh, missing oh never or this is not staged this is totally natural as we're doing it right now right so even in this very demo right now you're seeing live in real time you know just completely in real time how when you're pair programming you're going to miss something you're going to forget something and you might get the error this is why you have that extra hand and then people kind of differ some people wait until you're done done with your code and then they're going to say okay line 22 line 35 some people kind of take notes on the side so they don't bother your uh, thought process and then there's the annoying ones like myself You're like ah wait i got you you know you forgot this it depends on on the kind of atmosphere that you're trying to build as a lead uh, the last thing that i want to add here and then i'll you know give it back to you guys for like a minute or two to kind of ask any questions is that uh, as an engineering lead you have to do what your team is doing right well, if your team is writing code you have to write code with them if your team is building pipelines you have to build pipelines with them if your team is you know is making cookies you have to make cookies with them so you can show them you know like you say the manager coach model care right uh, it doesn't really come into fruition unless your hand is with your team hand actually doing work with them delivering software with them driving uh, things with them and this is the challenging part because you have other responsibility you have to manage a team you have to go to these meetings just to do this training you have to do all these different things this is where you kind of try to figure out how you can balance yourself you know and make sure you're still doing at least 20 30 40 percent of your time you know with your team all right Two minutes, any questions about this little show that we have for you guys? Are you entertained? <laughs> All right. Yeah, um, I, I, I think just on the, uh, uh, while uh, Andrew was writing just uh, the, the miss on once versus never. I was about to jump in to the pair programming more and then just, you know, suggest. So I think uh, that looks good. Um, there, there are other factors probably just that we cannot cover right mm -hmm. uh, on this uh, uh, session uh, mm -hmm. to be considered uh, for a, a successful uh, team uh, based on experience. Probably we can discuss offline and then just uh, get, uh, you know, streamline those things. I, I, uh, and, I, I I personally was involved in this kind of pair programming back nice. in back, back in the times, and it's it was and uh, as I said earlier, unless you properly set the the ground and the expectation, uh, it's a little challenging. But once you do that, there are lots of things that you can uh, enable the team to learn. Especially like just we used to uh, pass simply keyword. Nobody mm -hmm. uses mouse. You mm -hmm. know, just the shortcuts of like just doing yep. the little tricks that, yep. that you do and you learn uh, and everybody comes up with so many shortcuts like just uh, resharper was the the, the 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 tool at that time. So many uh, shortcuts and Visual Studio has got so many shortcuts. So those kind of learning along with the business uh, uh, thing. Uh, uh, scenarios was uh, uh, a plus during my experience. So just this is uh, a good uh, presentation. Thank you.
Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, we're at time, you know, please feel free to reach out. You know, if you have any questions, there's, you know, this is something that we actually adhere to and adapt on daily basis. And, you know, um, you know, we look forward to hearing more uh, about your experiences if you decide to adapt this kind of skill set and adapt this kind of culture. And uh, thank you all for coming. Andrew, thank you so very much for uh, pairing with me today and your patience. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.